Hello and welcome to tonight's show. Tonight's guest is Martin Armstrong. He is known as one of the most accurate forecasters of major financial economic events in the world. Armstrong has played a pivotal role in navigating major financial crises since the historic fall of the Franklin National Bank in 1974 and the subsequent dissolution of the Bretton Woods system. He has advised influential figures, including the Reagan administration, for significant events such as the Plaza Accord of 1985 and the investigation into the stock market crash of 1987. Martin Armstrong's unmatched ability to predict the rise and fall of countries and even wars is by using a sophisticated computer model that he developed. This groundbreaking creation accurately predicted the fall of communism in 1989 and even foretold the Russian bond defaults of 1998. Known as the secret cycle, his work has been hailed by many and feared by others. As he began to expose the real power players driving economic upheaval and wars using his model called Socrates, he was targeted and punished. Martin spent seven years in jail for contempt of court when the typical term for something like that is no more than 18 months. He was then accused of fraud, took a plea deal hoping, to hoping for time served, but in seemingly last-minute change of heart, the judge sentenced him to an additional five years in prison. And experts say there was never any evidence of fraud, that it was a targeted hit job meant to punish someone for exposing corrupted power. We're about to learn more about Martin's computer model and what he sees for the economic futures of the United States, China, and the world. Are we doomed? I think that's the big question many of us would like answered. But before we go into tonight's interview, let's get to our sponsors. Let's talk first about our great sponsor, Birch Gold. Now, as we may hear tonight, the dollar seems to be in trouble. The world is turning away from the U.S. and shoring themselves up to avoid sanctions and other economic fallout. We now see OPEC countries banding together, saying they don't want to only trade oil in dollars. So this has many worried about their future and their retirement accounts. And the fact is, there is one asset that has withstood economic upheaval and has a history being incredibly stable, and that is gold. And you can own it in a tax-sheltered retirement account with the help of Birch Gold. That's right, Birch Gold will help you convert an existing IRA or 401k, maybe from a previous employer, into an IRA in gold. And the best part? You don't pay a penny out of pocket. Just visit birchgold.com slash Kim for your free info kit. They're going to hold your hand through the whole process. Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and thousands of happy customers. So visit birchgold.com slash Kim to get your free info kit on gold. Again, visit birchgold.com slash Kim. Now, I'm someone who doesn't sleep very well, and my 11-year-old shepherd is getting older, and she's got those aches and pains. It's obvious when she gets up to walk. And this is why I looked into cbdistillery.com for a natural way to help me get some sleep and give my furry family member the relief that she needs. CB Distillery has over 2 million satisfied customers. 90% of customers reported they sleep better with CBD. 81% said CBD helps them with stress. 80% said CBD helps with aches and pains after physical activity. And if you struggle to get a good night's sleep, if you're dealing with too much stress and could use a little calm in your life, if you suffer with pain and discomfort, especially after physical exercise, try CBD from the source that I trust, cbdistillery.com. You're going to get 20% off your order when you enter my name, Kim, at checkout. There's no prescription required to order these products. That's cbdistillery.com. Promo code Kim for 20% off. All right, let's go ahead and get to our interview tonight with Martin Armstrong. Martin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Well, it's always a pleasure, and thank you for inviting me. Okay, so I want to start off with the economic model or the computer model that you developed. Give us a little bit of your background of how you got into, I guess, economics and computers and then ended up with this model. Well, um, actually, my father was a lawyer, and he was pushing me off into law school. And I was just always interested more in trading. So I really didn't want to do that. And he felt that that wasn't um, respectable, I guess. And so he pushed me into computers. And so I went, I did the whole computer engineering thing. Um, and then I got into design. And then <clears throat> back then, in the late 60s, the married guys were getting, you know, Hawaii, London, Paris. I wasn't married, so I was offered Tule Greenland, Guam, and Vietnam. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, basically, I ended up quitting, and then I, I went back to trading. 
And then I realized, gee, I could do a program to, to do this. And so it was interesting that at first I thought the computer skills were a waste of time. Um, but that's the way life is. We never know where we end up at. Right. So you're a, are you a programmer? Is that what you do? You code? Uh, yes, I did that. The whole Back then we had to do the whole bit. So uh, design, electrical engineering. Um, uh, so it, it, was, it was a fascinating field. Um, but, you know, being basically weaned on coding, I understood how to actually write a, a, a computer. And I mean, back then there, were, there weren't that many of us. I mean, I even knew Steve Jobs. Um, so, I mean, there's the whole idea of, of uh, AI, people might not realize, but actually that came from Star Trek. Um, <laughs> that inspired a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. And I think even when they were shooting off to the moon, they, inv they invited uh, the Star, Star Trek people to visit at NASA because um, they got them all the, the funding. Um, so that show actually really impressed a lot of people over the years. So you were a computer programmer, coder, builder, all of these things with computers. And this is early on and you're wanting to get into trading and you figure out that the computer could help you. Is that, is that what happened? Yes. I mean, I um, <clears throat> became more of an international hedge fund manager. And uh, I was, back then, the, a lot of the big money was with OPEC and had ended up opening an office in Geneva. And I could see how capital really moved. It was starting to move to Japan. Uh, so then you ended up with the Japanese bubble in 89. But the, the money moved, but also the talent moved. So after Japan uh, bubble burst, then, oh, let's go to Southeast Asia. And then, you know, so they ran off to there. And then that one bur bursts in 1994. Uh, so it's, I, I began to see that to track the capital flows would actually indicate where booms and busts were going to take place. Um, and we have one client in uh, in Lebanon, Universal Bank of Lebanon at the time, and they had found a ledger in the basement with somebody written down the Lebanese pound every day. Uh, going back in the mid 1800s and ask if we could build a model on it. I said, sure, send it over. And uh, it came out and it said, your, your country's going to fall apart in eight days. I called them. I, I thought something was wrong with it. I said, look, something's got to be wrong with this data. This is nuts. And they very calmly said, well, what currency would you recommend? I said, that's a strange response. And I said, well, it says the Swiss franc. They said, thank you very much. Eight days later, the Civil War began. Wow. Um, I saw the same thing happen. We had a client in Saudi Arabia. He was a big in shipper. Uh, and he calls me on the phone. He says, what do you think gold's going to do tomorrow? Uh, Iran's going to start attacking shipping in the Gulf. I said, you tell me a war's going to start tomorrow? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think? And so uh, <clears throat> by 1998... I understood that it's capital flows. You could see where wars were going to take place. I mean, if you're going to invade a country, you obviously sell everything first and move your money out. Um, and so in 1998, we did a conference in London and I stood up and I said, look, Russia is going to collapse and I give it about 30 days. We saw 100 um, billion going in, but we saw 150 billion coming out. And the London Financial Times happened to have snuck in the, in the room in the back. And the next thing I know, they put it on the front page of the uh, London FT saying, oh, Armstrong says Russia is going to collapse. And that was long-term capital management crisis and all that. So, I mean, after a while, it, it really made sense that like terrorists with the 9-11, then they were started using our model to look for anybody that bought puts just a few days before. Um, so you, you begin to see that the capital markets are very much influenced by war. Um, and you step back, you, you look at it. In 1896, the U.S. was bankrupt. That's when J.P. Morgan 
how to bail out the U.S. Treasury with a hundred million in a gold loan. And then by the time of World War II, the United States is the strongest economy in the world because all the money left Europe and came here. Um, so war has, has been very important from a global standpoint. Okay, so let's go back to um, to kind of break this down a little bit more so we can understand. So what year did you develop the model? Actually, probably around 1974. 1974, you developed the model. And this is when you were working in finance industry. Yes. And But you had the computer background, so you decide to Correct. start using this to, to build a model. Was there anyone else in the financial sector at that point that you knew of who was also had a computer background and they were develop, building models or were they outsourcing computer guy, you know, to computer guys to build models who didn't really understand financials and you just happen to understand both? Well, I understood both. They started, I would say, trying to mimic what we were doing, but that was more by the mid eighties. Um, <clears throat> Uh, when our model was becoming much more, you know, famous at that stage. And uh, I should say this, that <clears throat> um, back in like in 1985, I mean, I was called in by Congress to testify when they were going to create the whole G5 and all that sort of stuff back then. And um, <clears throat> when I was opening up in, in Geneva, I had sat down with one of our clients, which was one of the big Swiss banks, and I had a list of, of uh, European names, like European advisors, because I knew there was anti-Americanism in Europe at the time. And he laughed and he said, name one European analyst. And I couldn't. Uh, I was embarrassed. And he says, no, there." I said, look, I'm sure there is. I just don't know of any. And he said to me, he says, uh, there are none. Then he explained that because of World War II, all the, the politicians used the currency as a political, uh, you know, yardstick. So, you know, a German guy would say, you know, vote for me, see the Deutschmarks up against the, the dollar by 10%. So I sure so as I did a good job. So foreign exchange forecasting in Europe uh, became too political. And he said, the reason everybody uses you because you don't care if the dollar goes up or down. I said, it's just a trade, you know? Um, so it was a difference in the analytical world also between the United States and Europe at that time. And that's why we rose to, to such heights because we were the only ones really doing it. So this model that you built, what is it, uh, what type of data is being inputted into it? And then what is it spitting Pretty much out? everything um, <clears throat> I could, possibly find. Um, we had a team in London, went to the Royal Newspaper Library, writing down quotes of currencies back, you know, to 1900 and before, um, because it became clear that you, to, in order to forecast the future, you had to know where you were in the, in the past and how these things um, develop, uh, because history does repeat, it's mainly because human nature never changes. Um, mm -hmm. politicians will act the same way, you know, today as they did 200 years ago, you know, uh, it's just a fact of life. So you're putting in uh, for different countries, different currencies, the markets, like market data, uh, currencies into, uh, we put in weather, um, oh, weather. Okay. <laughs> everything, just about everything. Um, uh, most people don't realize, but the, the, uh, the whole idea of chaos modeling came from a study of weather. Hmm. Um, that's where it came from. Um, it was Edward Lorenz. He put everything in, in all this data into a computer and out came patterns and he was shocked. Um, so, I mean, these were the early days where people didn't quite, you know, it's not that we came up with a conclusion in advance and went to try prove it. It was more or less the opposite way um, that these things were emerging and like, oh, gee, look at that. How, how, you know, isn't that interesting? Yeah. So when you put in something like w with Lebanon, for example, what data did you insert into the model that then told you in eight days this country, this currency is collapsing? Well, it's it was their currency, but it was more or less uh, we put it into the computer and then it correlates it with everything else, all the other countries around it. Um, and 
I, I would say, look, the bank, <clears throat> when they casually said, gee, what currency would you recommend? Obviously, they had already saw something happening. Right. Uh, right. Which is why they came to us to say, could you make a model? And when I said it's going to fall apart in eight days, they were not shocked. Um, so they probably saw the capital flows themselves. Um, you know, people moving their money out and et cetera, knowing that something was going to happen. And they just wanted us, I think, to confirm on the timing. Yeah. And you were like, eight days. <laughs> so when they ask you, what currency, what are they, what are they asking for? Are they going to swap out currency? They're going to buy different currency. Like what were they going to do with the Swiss franc at that point? Yes. Uh, you, uh, you look basically, uh, it's always currency flows. One is going to go up better than another one. Uh, and that showed that that was the best. Um, and for example, even with, um, the, the whole Euro thing developing, uh, you know, I dealt with all the Japanese companies and they were like coming to us, okay, what country to go into? So we have the tax laws in there, uh, the currency, et cetera, uh, labor rates, and all this, We everything we could find, we stick into the computer and let it all correlate it out and come out with a, a forecast. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so I was actually the one you know, picking and choosing where they should go. If they were all manufacturers, like car manufacturers, I put them in Britain. And the airlines that needed the best tax rate, I put them in Ireland. Uh, I didn't put anybody in Germany. It was the taxes were 40% higher. Uh, that's how I got to meet Margaret Thatcher uh, because she was her economic advisor. I happen to know uh, Sir Alan Walters. And she said to him, it's just, I hear this, some guy out there telling people to come here. He goes, oh yeah, that's Marty. <laughs> and she's, you know him? And he's, yes. Yeah. So then that's how I, I got to meet her. And she even came and spoke at one of our conferences. Um, so it's, you know, it's a small world, uh, but the currencies are, are basically the window to how people think. Uh, even Milton Friedman had written in 1953 about a, a floating exchange rate and how he thought that would be the check and balance against government. And when I was speaking in Chicago, Milton came to, to, to listen to me. And he said, you're doing what I just dreamed about in 1953. Um, and he was correct. It's, so you see the, the rise and fall of currencies. It's all political. Do you have confidence in a country? Uh, if yes or no, um, you take what's going on right now with war. <clears throat> uh, just look at what China is doing. I mean, we're bad mouthing China all the time. China was the, the largest debt holder of the United States. Uh, suddenly they're selling billions of dollars every month, uh, reducing, of, of course, if you're going to go into war, uh, are you going to hold the debt of another country that, that could just cancel it on you? Um, you know, I don't know if our politicians really understand how the world functions, I mean, in all honesty. So are you saying that the ec economics is really not, uh, you know, because we know that there's ups and downs, ebbs and flows with the economy. And are you saying that they're actually driven by people? It's not really... Uh, just the function of economics itself, it's actually people-driven. Yes. Um, look, the, the wealth of a nation is its people. It's not gold reserves or something like this. Uh, if that was even true, then how could China, Japan, and Germany rise from the ashes when they didn't have gold reserves? Um, it's their people. The people are very productive. And that is why the U.S. basically emerged as the biggest economy, because we had what you would call a consumer economy. So um, everybody wants to you know, manufacture something and sell it to, to the American consumers. Whereas you look at Germany, Germany is more on the old mercantile type idea. We build things and sell it to somebody else. 
Mm -hmm. All right. So the German, actually, the net worth of the average German is less than an Italian. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's shocking. Uh, but they keep very high taxes, afraid of inflation, things of this nature. And they just want to sell to everybody else. That's why they were they wanted to create the euro to, to eliminate foreign exchange risk so they could sell more products throughout Europe. Mm -hmm. um, but the real wealth of a nation is its people. Uh, it's not the government. The governments are usually more, uh, I would say, more destructive to the economy than anything else. I mean, because th they act also under their own self-interest. They don't care mm -hmm. about us. They really don't. Right. They're just trying to uh, line the pockets of their cronies, right, and make them wealthier. And uh, all their corporate interests uh, is what it seems like. So... Okay, so let's let's just before we get into some of the nuts and bolts of that and how um, and, and wars and banks controlling the government, because I know these are things that you've said in the past that I want to bring up. But I just want to fast forward to today and just find out from you, where do you think we are economically today and the dollar? I mean, a lot of people are worried about the stability of the dollar right now. We do have Saudi Arabia saying, you know, maybe we're going to trade oil in different currencies and not just dollars anymore do have what's going on with China, war, obviously a proxy war with Russia right now, potentially a World War III if we keep egging everybody on. Where do you think the United States stands? Where's our economy headed? Um, the future is not necessarily that bright. Um, <clears throat> what Biden did but with the sanctions against Russia was uh, basically taking a spike and driving it through the heart of global economy. Um, when, when Russia went into Crimea, uh, <clears throat> that's when, you know, Obama went to Swift and said they wanted to have him removed. And Swift refused. They said, this is not a political system. All right. And so they replaced the head of Swift in 2019. And then they go, OK, remove uh, Russia from the Swift system. Oh, OK. What else do you want us to do? Um, mm -hmm. Even the indictment uh, of <clears throat> the international court against Putin is completely bogus. Um, if you look at the terms, they can, you know, the only country that they have any authority over are members mm -hmm. and who are members. Not China, not the United States, and not Russia, because right. none of them wanted them to be able to go after their people. So, I mean, it's just, you know, it's just window dressing is, is all this is. Uh, and you have to understand that that um, this is is by what they with the sanctions against Russia undermine the entire global economy. Because all of a sudden now China has its alternative to the SWIFT system. So you've basically divided the, the global economy. So you have Saudi Arabia saying, well, gee, you know, you know, we have to be able to deal with these other people who are no longer going to be in SWIFT. Simple as that. I mean, yeah. so, yes, they then have to start selling in different currencies. Um, it, that was, you know, the I would say the, the worst decision I've ever seen from any American administration ever, because uh, it effectively uh, destroyed the, the global economy. And um, as you know, I, I look at history a lot. And the way Rome created, you know, the Pax Romano was that everybody benefited. So as long as you, okay, fine, France, you were conquered, but hey, now we can sell our stuff to people everywhere else. It, and once you started dividing that, that's when Rome fell. But any the the fundamental basis of any civilization is every as long as everybody benefits, it works. Right. When you start targeting one against the other, it all falls, starts falling apart. So the United States, um, you think that our economy is going to collapse? Yes, I mean we're we're basically in a downward spiral at this point. It's not that the economy is going to collapse so much, but the political structures are uh, the country's way too divided now. It's it's almost like 
what Abraham Lincoln said, a country divided, you know, can't house divided, can't, can't stand. And yeah. it seems as though it's, it's this constant us against them sort of thing. Um, like you take California versus Florida. I mean, it's like night and day, like two different countries. Yeah. Well, do you think that we're headed for war? I know that your model's been able to predict wars, uh, essentially, like you did with Lebanon. Do you see a war wh where we, the United States, are actually in a war, maybe even on our soil or in full-on battle? Yes. Maybe civil there war. There is um, both. You're looking at basically civil unrest from all this um, division that's taking place, but also internationally. Uh, you know, this idea, I mean, we call them the neocons, and they've been around for a long time. And they're not Republican or Democrat. They're on both sides. And you can go on YouTube, and I think an enlightening one was um, McNamara, who was the uh, neocon back during Vietnam. And before he died, um, I think he wanted to clean his conscience, and he said we were wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, now tapes are out that, J, you know, that LBJ even said that for all he knew, they were shooting at whales that night. Um, you know, you have weapons of mass destruction and never existed. I mean, they have never told the truth about any war because uh, yeah. it's always about how much do we make and, and this, that. Uh, and it's an agenda. So I, I don't see this as... <clears throat> Uh, I would say, you know, the re main reason they had to get rid of Trump was because he realized that all they wanted to do was was war. And he started the, he wanted to pull out of Afghanistan. Um, and I mean, I actually went to dinner at his Mar-a-Lago back in March of 20. Um, and I was the first time I met many heads of state. And it was the first time anybody actually impressed me. Um because he said that he wanted to pull the troops out of Afghanistan, but he said he was sick and tired of writing letters to um, people that their son died in Afghanistan for whatever reason. He says, why are we there? They've been fighting over borders for a thousand years. What difference are we going to make? And I've never, in my 40 years of dealing with heads of state, I've never heard any of them concerned about the people that die on the battlefield, ever, not once. Um, so I, you know, Trump basically started firing all the neocons, um, you know, Bolton, etc. And just look around that they're all back in there again. They're the ones that drive this. I, I wouldn't say it's Biden. Um, you know, they're in control and they, I don't know what it is. Even Ron Paul even said that, you know, for some reason they've just wanted endless wars for the last 30 years and never won one of them yet. Uh, but um, this is unfortunately our fate, I think, that they keep poking the bear. And uh, unfortunately, you know, you can't do that. China also has to know that they're next. Um, yeah, well, I think they do know that. That sounds sounds yes. like if they're pulling billions of dollars out, uh, then that, that they do absolutely know. Were you able to predict with your model the pandemic? Uh, yes. Um, uh, we had a conference and <clears throat> I, I couldn't say at the time what it is, but there is a, a cycle to absolutely everything, uh, including disease. It, you know, um, there have been, you know, there's a cycle from diseases that go back, you know, into the Roman you know, Empire. Um, Viruses are, are cyclical. They're a life form that they rise and fall. I think this time our problem is, is that we maybe manufactured one and then we have no idea how it replicates once it's released. Mm -hmm. um, people are just beginning to find that out now. Um, but uh, there, there is nothing in this universe that doesn't have a cycle to it. That's why we're born, we live, and then we die. There's a cycle to absolutely everything, even climate change. I mean, uh, that I find is the biggest joke because climate has always changed. Yeah. I mean, there have been ice ages, warming periods. I mean, you know, 
how did we ever warm up if, if moms weren't driving SUVs and, you know, and taking the kids to school or something, you know, um, it's always been that way. Uh, so, you know, you go back to ancient history, they called it the sea people. They came in from the North and invaded the, the bronze age and overthrew them because it got cold up North. Simple as that. I mean, so they moved. I mean, the same thing with, uh, you know, Attila the Hun, and they said it was a major drought in, in Asia, and so they moved into into, into Europe. So yeah. weather does impact that stuff. And we do have to, you know, that's why we put that in the in the model as well, uh, because it has impacted the even the movement of people around the world. Are you able to see what is going on with China? Um, there's a lot of chatter, of course. Um, it's hard to know what is real, what's accurate, and what isn't accurate in the U.S. media and with our politicians when it comes to China, because the agenda, you know, the agenda is strong. There's a lot of politicians who are very war hawkish against China. I would say mostly mm -hmm. on the right, interestingly. Republicans tend to be more hawkish on China, seeming to want to uh, get us into a conflict with them. Democrats are more so against Russia. Not a good mix when both sides are against some big major power, right? Um, but what what is really going on with China? Some people are saying that their economy is collapsing, that they're on the brink, they're not doing well, that they're not going to end up being the next global power. And then, of course, others say, yes, they are. It's inevitable. China's the next big global power. They're going to replace us. What do you think is happening with China? No, our computer says China will basically emerges the financial capital of the world after probably 2032. Um, <clears throat> and it's not so much that the United States, that I would say that China is doing good or bad. It's also that we're doing worse. Um, it, it's, it's like, you know, Britain was the number one financial center uh, until they started World War I. Then it moved to the United States. Um, mm -hmm. You go back, I mean, it was... Uh, Cyrus of, of Babylon that basically was the financial capital. He had tried to attack um, Athens. Uh, he lost. Athens ends up the number one and then you know, eventually moves to Macedonia. Then from there it moves to Rome. I mean, so it's never been in one place forever. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, but it seems that, to be moving a lot faster. I mean, the United States has only been the, the global powerhouse since when? Uh, after World War II, perhaps. or uh, So that's not very long to be at the top of the food chain. Um, it, you know, when you look at the Roman Empire, how long did they last at the top of the food chain? So it seems to be moving a lot faster. Do you think that when China becomes the new global financial center, uh, how long do you think that would last? Uh, probably a little more than 200 years. Um, the interesting thing about China versus the West is they actually believe in cycles from a religious standpoint. Um, <clears throat> so I never had to explain cycles <laughs> to, uh, uh, to, to anyone in Asia, you know, that's basically part of their, their, their ideas. Mm -hmm. um, the, what you have to understand about China is that uh, they are actually quite smart. Um, when there was the Asian currency crisis in 97, uh, I was uh, invited by China to Central Bank and I went over to meet them. I was surprised, um, but I, I wanted to go see the Great Wall. <laughs> so I said, sure, why not? I thought I would have to listen to a couple of bureaucrats or whatever. And it was very interesting that they had sent these people out, worked on trading desks in New York, London, Tokyo. Then they went back to to run the central bank. And um, so they were traders, which is then it made sense why they called me. Uh, and <clears throat> funny thing is when I came back to the States, the guys from the US Treasury and the Fed called me, gee, what was it like? What do you think? I said, it's very interesting. They only hire people who actually have experience. <laughs> uh, but uh, they understood, and you have to look at what China is doing is they understood what made the United States great. It was a consumer-based economy. So they have been trying to build this thing, you know, they're, they're what they call the, the new Silk Road. Um, they have been focusing internally on that consumer-based. 
whereas Germany was was basically what can we make and sell to somebody else to get some money. Mm-hmm. Um, China is not really following that model. Um, so uh, their economy is going to do far better than most people suspect. Uh, yes, there's always going to be ups and downs. I mean, uh, Rome was one government, you know, but how many civil wars did they have? Uh, so, um, you know, it's you, you, there's always going to be ups and downs, but eventually China is at least moving in the right direction of a consumer based economy versus a mercantile type thing uh, that uh, that Europe took on. Um like if you just even look in the trade negotiations, you know, the French said they didn't want anybody in California calling something a champagne because it's not really from champagne. And they, you know, they wanted the names changed. I mean, it's that kind of pettiness. <laughs> um, and <clears throat> so it's, it's uh, that that's really, I think what, what keeps Europe from really advancing. Um, and, you know, I, when they were creating the Euro, they actually came to me and i sat down with them and I told them, I said, what you're saying is, is false. Not everybody's going to pay the same interest rate unless you consolidate the debts. But, uh, for Germany to go in, they wouldn't cons- consolidate the debts. That was off the table. So each country was left with its own, its own debt. Mm-hmm. And I warned them that the problem is, is that you're just going to transfer the, the volatility from the currency to the bond market. And that's all that's happened. So then they complain, oh, they're paying 3% versus us. We're paying five, you know, um, you know, it, it still creates this unity. And um, I, you know, I, I explained to them, I said, you don't, you just don't understand. What made the United States great was not a single currency. It was a single language. I said, the United States, uh, ironically, what made the U.S. work was that discrimination. Whoever was the last one off the boat uh, didn't get a job until they spoke English. <laughs> and once they did, everybody, so you ask an American, you say, gee, what am I? You know, and, or what are you? And you go, oh, well, I'm half German, half Irish, whatever, which you don't see in Europe. Because they don't even speak the same languages. I mean, right. there's always exceptions, but you don't see, you know, somebody from Sicily going up and marrying somebody from Scotland. So um, let's get into how the banks are controlling the governments and why wars continue to why wars are so profitable. If you could get into that, uh, because we do seem to be an endless war, and obviously, war is a treacherous thing. People are dying on the battlefield, and yet. This is making some people gobs and gobs of money. So how does that work? How does that factor in? Well, when the U.S. did not have a national debt, and when the Civil War took place, um, you had uh, Lincoln basically went to uh, a cooking company, which was a, a, a like a financial, you know, um, broker. It was selling bonds of, of railroads and everything to everybody off the street to, to the common people. And so uh, they said, sure. Jay Cook said, you know, OK, fine, we'll sell your debt for you. So ever since then, the U.S. basically always went to a bank to sell its debt. It didn't do it directly. It, that's only now starting um, Fed Direct. Uh, and so when these banks in New York would get involved in manipulating markets and they'd lose billions of dollars, whatever, they just hand out, you know, stick their hand out and said, well, if you don't bail us out, who's going to sell your debt? So it was kind of a blackmail thing. Um, so that's why, you know, you saw um, endless bailouts all the time and nobody ever went to jail because basically the government needed them to sell it. Mm-hmm. Um <clears throat> And the problem now that's happening and why they created even Fed Direct is that the amount of debt coming out of the United States is massive. And the, the, we, they're what we call primary dealers, these banks. They line up. To be a primary dealer, you have to guarantee to buy X amount of the debt. 
Now, there's more debt coming out than they have the money to be able to buy and then try to resell it. So the Fed is now starting this Fed Direct uh, because you're, you've expanded the debt so much that the banks cannot necessarily handle it. And every time the Fed raises interest rates, they lose money. So it, it's, a, it's a very interesting situation. Uh, but that's why at this point we're going beyond what the banks can actually handle. Hmm. And then why, why is war so profitable? It's, uh, it, it is stunning. Uh, actually, there's, there's a report that just came out, um, from the inspector general that, uh, <clears throat> you know, they can't even account for all these weapons that they've sent supposedly to, to Ukraine. Yeah, right. Missing. All right. Now, this isn't something new. You can Google and go back and see, you know, Rumsfeld uh, the day before 9-11 says, oh, well, gee, yeah, okay, $2.3 trillion is missing from the defense budget. We don't know where it is. Mm-hmm. $2.3 trillion? Um, I mean, it, it, it's... Um, when I was a hedge fund manager, we handled three trillion, which was about fifty percent of the U.S. national debt. Two point three. I mean, that's at the level you were getting at back then. Yeah. Uh, for that to be missing, um, it's just it's it's just insane. And the same thing happened with Afghanistan. Uh, in fact, um, <clears throat> Obama even had to pass a law because these these weapons were ending up on the black market and on the streets in the United States. Uh, it, it's manufacturing this stuff is is endless uh, and the profits seem to go uh, who knows where because they don't do the accounting and keep saying, oh well, you know money's missing or this is well where'd it go? Uh, and if, if anybody in Congress demands accountability, they shout them down. How dare you ask for accountability? You know, mm-hmm. it's, um, I know Ukraine very well. Um, we had two employees there, one on the Donbass side and one on the Kiev side. The two of them wouldn't even talk to each other. Um, and it's the, Literally, it's an understatement to say it's the most corrupt government probably on the face of the earth. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's just that's just the way Ukraine has always been. Um, and it's a cultural thing. I don't see it, you know, changing. I mean, even the IMF was holding back money until they tried to, you know, bring in some of the corruption. And it was just a waste of time. Yeah. It's a black hole, really is a black hole. Right. Let's talk about why you have been so fiercely targeted. Um, You did spend time in prison. Uh, The the reasons why you spent in particular seven years in prison are absolutely shocking and uh, abhorrent and really a cautionary tale for so many people, just the power or the abuse of power that could actually happen. And I want to get into that. But first, I want to get into why were you targeted? Before they threw you in in prison, what was it you were doing? What was it you were exposing or who were you exposing that made you so threatening to them that they would go after you to that level? I think largely um, two two factors. One, um, our computer would, like I said, in 98, we stood up and said, Russia is going to collapse in 30 days. It did. That was long-term capital management crisis. Um, uh, you know, even the guy that uh, ended up stealing money from our accounts, uh, Evan Safra, he lost a billion dollars on that day. Uh, it so the bankers were always trying to uh, bribe people, and they think that bribing uh, guarantees them you know, the perfect trade. And I was even invited down. They, they put on a full, uh, they rented the national gallery in Washington, DC and put on a dinner for the IMF. I was invited down there 
I mean, every politician was there. I was even holding plates for talking to Paul Volcker at the time. Um, and it was all to impress me how they had the IMF in their back pocket. And I said, I don't care, you know, who you have. My computer says you're going to fail. They didn't like that. So from their perspective, they thought I had too much influence. So they were always telling the, the CFTC that um, they actually um, issued a subpoena for me to turn over all my list of all my clients and accused me of manipulating the world economy. I mean, it was just like, excuse me, <laughs> uh, even a central bank can't do that. Um, and so then they started, you know, civil contempt. And civil contempt, the statute says maximum is 18 months. They kept me for seven years. Yeah. I finally got out only when I got to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ordered them to explain what the heck was going on. And then rather than respond, they said, oh, well, he's no longer in prison. We've released them. And that's how they get out of this stuff. Yeah. Uh, and people have to understand that, that um, I mean, they're, they're now going to make a Hollywood movie on it. I mean, you, you can't imagine j judges changing transcripts. And uh, I mean, they do whatever they need to do. Uh, it, it's, it's a sad state of affairs. But when the rule of law collapses, so does the country. Uh, but what was it that, that you think, it. were they going, were they trying to silence you? Were they trying to gain access to your model? Were they, um, was it revenge because there were some people who were angry with you because maybe you made them lose money or something? I mean, what do you think caused them to even put the target on your back to begin with? What did well, they want? Well, I think, um, I mean, look, I traded heads to head, you know, against Soros, even, I mean, even cost them a billion dollars one day. <laughs> um, so the bankers, it was basically always, uh, you got to shut this guy up because I was the one on the, the opposite side. Um, <clears throat> from the government side, after the computer forecast the collapse of, of Russia, uh, that's when the CIA came in and they said they wanted me to go down and build this model for them. And I said, look, uh, it cost, it took me 17 years to build it here. I mean, I'm not going to go down to, to DC. And I said, look, we'll run any study you want. And that's when they came out and said, no, we have to own it. I said, well, I'm sorry, it's not for sale. Um, and <clears throat> so they put me in contempt and thought they could basically, you know, that would silence the model and it didn't. Um, in fact, the, it, the very day of the model's forecast for 2007, and I was put in in 1999, was the day of the collapse of, of the real estate bubble. And on the floor, they were calling it, they were saying, I mean, right to the very day, on the floor, they were saying, this is Armstrong's revenge. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, you know, I think it, it's been fascinating for me to to um, to have bumped into this, why it is so accurate um, has stunned me, but it has forecast so many things, even 9/11 right to the day. Um, uh, it, it's it. I think honestly that that there is a, a pressure within the system, and it causes the politicians to respond at that time. That's yeah. all I can really right. conclude. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, but it has forecast the rise and fall of countries for, for decades now. I mean, it's, um, I mean, just about every intelligence agency around the world now follows it, but, um, mm -hmm. uh, it, so, it's, you know, it's a fascinating model of, again, it was not something I anticipated in advance. It was something that I stumbled into and has been um, just a very interesting experience in trying to follow it. And you're still doing the model. So you're out of prison and you're still doing the model. Are you worried that they're going to target you again? Um, I think basically what has come down to is a Mexican standoff, as they say. Um, they want the forecast, so they leave me alone. Um, but 
I mean, I've been out for like over what, 13 years or something. And so mm -hmm. um, it had throwing me in prison had the opposite effect. Uh, and yeah. it's more or less, kind of, I think their danger of what they're doing to Trump. When I was put in, they thought that would end my career. And instead, everybody said, well, now I know I really can trust you. Right. You're not one of them. Right. And, and I, I want to clarify this for everybody watching. So Martin went to prison um, an unprecedented amount of time, seven years for contempt of court. Contempt of court typically at maximum is 18 months. So they threw Martin in prison. or j Was it jail for the contempt or were you in an actual prison facility? At no, the, uh, it, worse. It's um, it's a, a jail in a high rise okay. building. Right, which is worse than a prison. Yeah, you'd rather be going to prison where you've got space and um, you can walk outside, see the sun. Right, I mean, yeah, it's more. Um, uh, I never more, saw uh, the sun or, or felt rain for for that whole period of time. You're you're locked in a high rise building. Terrible. So for seven years, Martin was thrown into into jail uh, for contempt of court when it should have only been at maximum eighteen months. Uh, because they wanted you to turn over a bunch of stuff you didn't have. They never did they ever get any of that stuff that they were demanding you had that you did not have. So they just held you in jail for seven years. You then ended up having to do a plea deal. What they were trying to go after you for was fraud, right? They were saying that there was some that you had uh, that there was money that was missing from some accounts. And by uh, from everybody that I watched, um, a lot of these other the experts are saying that they never, ever were able to get you on. There was never any actual evidence there, that the trial or there was no real weighing of the evidence to see if you were actually guilty of any of this, uh, that ultimately it didn't get to that point. So there's no th there is no evidence that you ever committed any fraud. They just made these claims. You ended up doing a plea. You ended up getting uh, five years for the fraud. Right. But they wouldn't allow you to use the seven years served already towards that. Yes. So they made you then serve an additional five years. Um, it, it was giving the bank the benefit of the doubt. The Japanese government sent over a simple auditing letter. It said, please confirm uh, he has $10 billion on deposit there. They had asked me to put to bring over ten billion dollars to invest in their their scheme for Russia, and I said no. <clears throat> so perhaps uh, the bankers thought I took the ten billion and I didn't really put it there at the bank. I took it someplace else. I don't know. Um, they then ran to the government and said, "Oh, we don't know where the money is." So the government runs in, just please whatever the bankers say. Somebody went back to Japan and said, please confirm $10 billion. And then the Japanese government sent a second letter 13 days later. Oh, so sorry, made a mistake of uh, decimal point it was 1 billion. And that's what Safra had taken. Um, so I basically, once the government does something like that, they'll never admit a mistake. Right. So I went to my clients and I said, listen, you better come over here and file suit against this bank or you're never gonna see a dime. And they did. Um, I worked with my clients. They filed suits against the bank. The bank then had to plead guilty and return all the money. Um, so that's why there was never anything against me. At the end, my plea, you look at it, it says, I failed to tell my clients that the bank took the money for its own benefit. I don't even know if that was a crime. <laughs> um, I mean, it's just, it, you know, and I was told Oh, just say this and you'll get time served. You'll be left. And then the judge says at the last minute, no, I can't do that. So, I mean, right. it, it's basically it was to really try and stop the forecasting more than anything um, for the bankers. Yeah. And I know attorneys are always going to tell you to plead out. I mean, most most cases are pled out. They'll say just say you're guilty and, uh, uh, you know, you'll get. In, in your case, maybe they thought time served because you already did seven years in jail and that ended up not being the case. You had to go to prison as well. So at this time, you know, this was in the late 90s and through the 2000s, you were early 2000s, you were serving in prison. Um, that back, you know, now the, the climate has changed as far as what people think about law enforcement, politics, the government. 
I think many of us are more aware of the corruption, the abuse of power. We look at people like Stephen Dozinger, who went after Chevron, and he also got the same sort of treatment, you know, where he was locked mm -hmm. up indefinitely for things that, for years, essentially uh, on house arrest for something that really should have only been a month or something. You know, it's, we're, we're seeing these abuses of power when you go after power. And I think now people are more willing to listen to that and say, I believe you. Maybe back in 2000, people would say, I don't know, Martin, you must have done something wrong. If they're putting you in jail, if they're putting you in prison, you did it. Do you feel like, uh, I'm sure, and I know there were a lot of people who definitely did not believe that you did, that you did anything wrong. And I've seen, I've watched the testimonies online. M many people said you did absolutely nothing wrong. They just went after you and they figured out a way to do it and they abused their power. But at that time, I don't know if the general population really felt that way. And now I think at least half the country feels, I mean, we watch what's going on with Donald Trump and we're sitting there like, okay, uh, I mean, this is just, you're going after somebody that you don't want to have power. So do you feel like now people listen to your story and they see how you were targeting financial markets, banks, wars, and you know, if you're able to say, hey, I think all this is happening, and these are the players involved, do you think that now people have a different attitude towards you than they did then? Are you, are you feeling a shift? Um, from, I would say from more from the general public, yes. Uh, from my clients and people that were in the financial industry, they knew the allegations were, were just didn't even make sense. Um, and, you know, even with the press, I found it interesting that uh, in it was April of of 2000. Um, the first time the Associated Press actually published, they said we question whether Armstrong is going to get a fair trial. Um, the judge put some sort of of notice written on the door, closed court proceedings, and we're all mm -hmm. supposed to be entitled to open court, you know. And I don't know if the journalist was already inside or she went past the, the, the note and didn't read it or something. But when I got there, the judge had the marshal go around the room to see who everybody was, found out she was from the Associated Press and says, get out of my courtroom. She walked right up to the desk and she says, we're the Associated Press, you can't kick us out. And he basically ordered the marshal to take her by the arm and drag her out of the courtroom. She published in the Associated Press I was April 27th, 2000, and, and I had met a few people from the press afterwards. They said, when that happened, we knew you were innocent. They don't throw out the press out of a courtroom like that. It's yeah. supposed to be an open court. Uh, it, you know, I think it, you know, as like I said, they just, they rush into things because this is how a prosecutor, uh, you just look down the list, Chris Christie, um, all, all of them, uh, you know, you, they look for somebody who has a, a big reputation, take him down, then you can run for politics, become mayor, maybe president. This is, this is simply the way it is. So you're dangling a carrot in front of these people when they begin to look at their personal career. Right. And, and that is wrong. And I think that's the problem with the legal system. And I will say that <clears throat> when they did the movie on me, the forecaster, I was in Frankfurt and, you know, there was after the movie played, one woman stood up. And she says, oh, this is what's wrong with America. They don't, you know, their rule of law. And some I thought it was funny because a lawyer in Germany stood up. He says, we do this to people here all the time. <laughs> oh. uh, so, I mean, it's, it, it's been a fascinating experience, uh, I would say. And I don't, people ask me, gee, well, how come you're not resentful? Because I think it taught me a lot. Um, I got to see from inside the, the, the belly of the beast what the beast really is. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if I would have the courage to stand up as much as I do today if I hadn't gone through that. Um, so it's kind of, uh, it's a weird situation, but I now really do know what, how I've seen it on both sides. It just, it, it's fat. It's, uh, 
frightening to find out that we live in a, in a country that would do things like this. But we see it happening over and over and over again to innocent people that they just don't like who are calling question uh, to mm -hmm. power. You know, like Julian Assange, who's sitting in a jail right now because he exposed war crimes. You know, there's um, th this happens a lot. You know, whether you agree with the person, whether you agree with what they were exposing or how they went about it, 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 it the, the fact is, is that the powers that be will take you down, they'll silence you, they'll figure out a way to punish you and make an example out of you, hoping that you never do it again and people around you never try to follow in your footsteps, you know, and they, and they will actually throw innocent people away. And, and I think now we're kind of starting to see more and more of this, or at least recognize that it's happening and it's, it's incredibly frightening. It's just not the country we grew up believing we were living in. You know, we were taught something it's, completely different. And it's not just the United States. I mean, you know, I encounter this on a global scale. It's, yeah. I think it's the old maximum, you know, power corrupts and ultimate power ultimately corrupts. I mean, if there's, there's no check and balance, um, I mean, the judge I have was Richard Owen. You can Google that. There were so many people that he, he had dementia. He would forget who I was. I walk in the court and, and he would, because I was in, in <clears throat> contempt, I would, ha I would still have to go to court in a suit and tie, not handcuffed in orange and something like that. And then, you know, one day he was like, counselor, counselor, you're arguing well for your client, but I want this in a brief. And then I'm leaving. And then the marshal goes, oh, so you're the lawyer. I said, no, I'm the defendant. And he goes, yeah, I know. This guy's crazy. I mean, this is what you go through. It, it, you, it's just mind boggling. Yeah. Um, the judges are there for life and some, and he, you can Google it. I mean, so many lawyers came out and, about him and he had dementia. Um, it, it this is there's no you know they don't even get to the to the court of appeals until they're 65. yeah so okay, it's, so it's we, a sad state of affairs yeah it would well that's a, a a nice way to say it actually um martin we're running out of time so i just want to ask you know for everybody watching uh what what would be your your big thing that we should all be doing right now like what's the prediction i suppose maybe with our money or with where should we live should we be living here should we be uh socking away gold like what is it that you what do you what do you recommend for us right now your big prediction are well, we collapsing uh, in 8 days you know something like that no uh think of more than 8 days but um <laughs> i wouldn't go too much beyond 2029 uh, you have to understand that the United States will most likely split. Um, and it's usually along the same lines of, um, of, of philosophy that it did before. So you'll probably see South and Midwest against the North, uh, East and California. And uh, this is just the way, you know, societies go. You can't have... <clears throat> one side say okay we're, we're now up to bat and we get to push whatever we want and force it on everybody else that's not democracy that's not civilization um and so we are going to see more civil unrest we're unfortunately going to see war because these people um i think they sadly believe some of their own rhetoric that oh russia's weak and we can defeat them um, and they never consider, what if you're wrong? Why these people always want war? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, the only thing I concluded was that when Khrushchev said, we will bury you, they came up and said, well, we will go the opposite way. But even when communism failed, they still wanted to go the other way. Uh, you know, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but look, they're going to, the whole move for this is, at the governments have been borrowing since World War II with no intention of paying anything back. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, this is what the whole digital currency is about. Um, they are using war and they are already planning that they would end up with a new Brenton Woods and default on all the debts uh, and then start over again. That's what Schwab is saying. You own nothing and you'll be happy. I mean, this is... Uh, basically just a, 
make it sound like they're doing it for you when it's really for them. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, the IMF has already come out and has prepared its digital currency to replace the dollar. This is where we're going. Uh, they think that, you know, they can create this complete authoritarian world and, and our computer says they're going to fail. Yeah. Um, so after 2032, we're going to, we get to rebuild a new world um, our way this time. Are you sure? Absolutely. Do you think it's really going to be our way or is it going to be there more of this uh, WEF, uh, you know, we're, I will yeah, tell you'll own nothing um, we'll, and you'll be happy. You're going to eat bugs. You're going to live in 15 minute cities and uh, um, all that sounds very nice. Uh, <clears throat> Schwab's great reset is our 2032. He's been taking stuff from us for years. All right. When they did the movie on me, The Forecaster, uh, they, they got, it was funded by a German TV. He called that guy and said he wanted him, and he paid him to do a movie on him called The Forum. Uh, whatever uh, we have done, we started our World Economic Conference in 1985. He started his first world um, event in 1987. It's, mm -hmm. it's been back and forth between the two of us for a long time. Um, he's not going to uh, prevail. Uh, he is a control freak. Um, if you even make one mistake, you're in trouble in the WEF. Yeah. So maybe, so you're thinking that, uh, it all is well, 2032, you say is the year that is when we're going to, we'll be okay. We'll end up starting over. Uh, yes. Uh, look, I've, I've been behind the Berlin wall before it fell. And like I said, I was, I was called in by China, uh, and <clears throat> One of the most fascinating things is in is understanding how people think. Uh, in China, I was taken to this facility, and they had about three hundred people um, surfing the internet, downloading everything, and I was actually helping them become capitalists. The the, the questions I got were were so rudimentary; it was crazy. Um, it was, <clears throat> They had 249 varieties of tea. And under communism, that tea is a dollar everywhere, even if it costs you $10 to get it to the other side of the country. Mm -hmm. All right, that was their problem. Communism doesn't work. It's just inefficient. And they were asking me, why is this one tea selling for like a dollar here and five dollars here? They didn't understand it. I said, people, number one, they'll pay more for something they like better. And two, you have transportation costs. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, really? I said, yes, okay. <laughs> I mean, this is the level that I was dealing with. Um, so I've seen it on, on both sides, uh, from Russia, I've seen it in China, and I know what works and what it doesn't work, and that's why communism failed. And Schwab can say whatever he wants. It is inefficient, and it will not work. Okay. Martin, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This was a really great conversation. Fascinating. I'd love to have you back to talk more about other subjects. I know you've got a lot of other uh, topics we could talk about. In particular, I know your new book, The Plot to Seize Russia, The Untold History, which I think would be very fascinating to get into. Um, but we'll have to do that another time because we've run out of time. But very fascinating. Where can people find these models that they can maybe use for themselves? Can can a nor can a, a, a normal person like myself go and, and use, use the model and start plugging away some things and see some predictions? Yeah, no, you can. Um, you go to armstrongeconomics.com. Um, and okay. that will basically give you a lot of avenues to everything else. Okay, excellent. All right, Martin, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me.